Velocity banking is a marketing gimmick. Yes, you heard me say it. I absolutely agree with those that believe velocity banking is a marketing gimmick. Now I'm gonna give you my reasons why, and we're gonna dive into just getting a really good understanding of these two words. Where do they come from? What does it mean? What is it referring to, right? And, and really behind it all, at the end of the day, it's just a marketing gimmick. It, it gets people to click. It's, uh, what do they call it? I forgot what they call it. Uh, put it in the comments. What is it called uh, when they, you know, it's like bait, clickbait. There you go. It is clickbait. Velocity banking, those two words are hot topic, hot trending words in the finance space. So I want to give shout out credit to Rich McCormick from School of Personal Finance who put this unique title together. Velocity Banking is a marketing gimmick. And he did two videos, a part one and a part two. I watched both of them. Very good. I agree with pretty much majority of what he says. And so what I'd like to do for the community that believes in the concept and you've gotten, you know, tremendous results, I want to help you articulate the message clearer when you're talking to family and friends that um, maybe have seen videos like this, negative videos, Velocity banking is a marketing gimmick. Velocity banking is a scam. All these different things. Just going to give you that confidence that at the end of the day, you're summarizing an idea of what you're doing. If you try to explain to someone brand new what you're doing in terms of how you're paying off your debt faster by leveraging a line of credit and a credit card at the same time and you're running bills through the credit card and getting cash back rewards and you're offsetting the daily interest and you're paying no interest on the credit card and then you're sending all your income into this line of credit which reduces the interest cost the daily periodic rate reduces because of the balance owed so you're you're offsetting the interest cost and you move the debt from a from this debt over here and you put it in here, you're essentially consolidating. That person already walked out the door, right? Your, your fiance, your boyfriend, girlfriend, your husband, wife, your mom, dad, sister, brother, they've already checked out. They've already checked out. But for some reason, when we say, what are you doing? Oh, I'm using this strategy called velocity banking to accelerate my debt really fast. I'm gonna pay it off, pay off all my debt in five to seven years or less. Are you interested? Absolutely. Boom. The door opens up. It is a marketing strategy. It's a way of articulating a message to the uninitiated, to the to the unknowing people, the, the people who aren't aware of this particular strategy. It brings awareness, piques their interest, they want to learn more, they engage, and then they go transform their lives. So from that perspective, uh, I absolutely agree with those that say that this is a velocity banking marketing gimmick. Now, where where Rich and I may disagree is as it relates to the actual, like, what are we doing? And like, how are we using this particular method, right? And I, and I think the another thing that him and I probably might disagree on is when we say daily periodic interest or average daily balance or simple interest daily or daily compounded simple interest or simple interest daily compounding. These words, when used to compare against amortization interest or amortized loan where rich and i might disagree is he'll say you know simple interest and amortized interest are the same thing now if you were to google is simple interest and amortized interest the same thing every article you will find for the most part is showing a difference is even banks right banks major banks right articles are showing there is a difference between how simple interest is calculated and how amortization interest is calculated. There is a difference. Some say there isn't at its core. It's basically the same thing. And I, I can understand where they're coming from. But when we actually get into true application of this particular strategy in combination with a simple interest debt, there is a vast difference, especially when we look at rate and how the rate gets charged to the debt. There's a difference. So we might disagree there, but let's look, take a look at the whiteboard and let's look at some other marketing terms that get used to describe velocity banking. So you have velocity banking and then you have another marketing term called paycheck parking and another term called accelerated banking. These are sexy terms to describe a fairly complicated, confusing type of a strategy. Allows us to leverage debt to pay off debt or leverage debt to invest and make more income. That creates more cash flow. So if we remove the terms at its core level, this idea of velocity banking, if we remove that term, 
remove paycheck, remove accelerated banking at the core, what you are doing is replacing your checking account with a credit card, a HELOC or a PLOC or a BLOC for business owners, right? One of these four tools is what you're essentially using to replace the function of your checking account. What does a checking account do for us? Well, it's where money comes in, right? So income that you and I generate has to land somewhere for all of us it lands in a checking account and then that money will sit in this checking account and it pays bills and it pays debts and then what's left over after bills and debts are paid is cash flow so cash flow is left over after all bills and debts are paid where does that cash flow go well for some people it'll get moved out of the savings account and it'll uh, out of the checking account and it'll go into a savings account or they might transfer it to a brokerage account or a money market or a CD or wherever right that's that net cash either all bills and debts are paid or what a lot of people do is they take that cash flow and they eventually make an extra payment on their debt. So what happens is that cash flow doesn't reveal itself for most people till the end of the month. So that cash flow was sitting in the checking account doing nothing, earning nothing. And then it was deployed after all the bills and debts were paid. Then the individual that's trying to pay off their debt faster is doing so by making an extra payment. So this model of make money, spend money, have cash flow, extra cash flow, pays off debt is the traditional model of eliminating debt. Now, what I just explained there has marketing terms. Those marketing terms are called debt snowball, debt avalanche, extra payments, right? These are marketing gimmicks that attract eyeballs, that get people to say, well, what is debt snowball? That sounds, debt avalanche, extra pain, what? What does that mean? It's exactly what I just explained. Very simple though, right? Much simpler, bringing it back, to velocity banking by removing the terms, the first thing that's happening is you're replacing your checking account, you're replacing that function of where money lands. So instead of your income landing in your checking account, you immediately would move the money from your paycheck into one of those four products, a line of credit. Then from there, that line of credit, you then extract money back out, depending on the tool, money would come out, pay bills, pay debts. And then what happens is you would have a debt such as a car and in the form of chunks, typically, or lump sums, you would move the car debt from one location into the line of credit. There is a marketing term for that. That is called debt consolidation, where you move debt from one location to another. So, so far, what I'm doing is I'm building and incorporating everything that I just said into one strategy, which I typically will name it Velocity Banking. Velocity Banking leverages these marketing strategies, leverages debt consolidation, and leverages the traditional function of a checking account and moves all of that into a line of credit while still simultaneously keeping all these different things. So what happens is your line of credit replaces the checking account. You still have the checking account. You're not going to close the checking account because you still need a location to send your money to for your employer. Checks go into a account and routing number. Boom. Automatic. First move. Money comes out of the line of credit to say make a chunk another marketing term or lump sum payment to pay off or pay down a debt. Let's just use the example of pay off. So you literally would pay off the car with the available credit limit of this line of credit. So the car is paid off, you now owe nothing. The payment, you now don't owe a payment to the car, but the debt got moved to the line of credit. So now you owe that same amount of money in the line of credit. But now instead of traditionally waiting till the end of the month to make the extra payment, towards the debt, once you paid all your bills and you have your net cash flow left over, you're actually immediately faster paying the debt off of the car and then your income is now, all of the income is now paying down the line of credit. So now money came out, paid off the car, income came in, got moved to the line, then money comes out of the line again to pay the remaining bills of that month and it creates this cycle. This refers to the velocity of money.
Let's look up the definition velocity of money. If you've never heard that before, the velocity of money, we're going to learn the definition together. Go to my share my screen here. Velocity of money definition. Velocity of money is a measurement of the rate at which consumers and businesses exchange money in an economy. What in the heck does that mean? Let's read a little bit more. It is the number of times that money moves from one entity to another. The velocity of money also refers to how much a unit of currency is used in a given period of time. Simply put, it's the rate at which consumers and businesses in an economy collectively spend money. The velocity of money is usually measured as a ratio of gross domestic product, GDP, to a country's M1 or M2 money supply. The word velocity is used here to reference the speed at which money changes hands. So understanding the velocity of money is important to understanding velocity banking. Velocity of money is important for measuring the rate at which money moves in circulation is being used for purchasing goods and services. It is used to help economists and investors gauge the health and vitality of an economy. One of the major issues that I believe majority of Americans have is their velocity of money in their own household economy. So if you had to take that macro definition of businesses, consumers in a economy, and you had to shrink that down all the way down to your household, your household economy, the way you can translate that is how quickly is money coming into your economy? How quickly is it exiting? How many times are you using $1 in your economy to get a particular job done? By using the velocity of money concept strategy, you're able to inject additional capital via debt that you would owe to speed up the way your money moves from checking to pay bills, bills back to checking, line of credit to checking, checking to line of credit, line of credit pays bills, increasing that speed at which money moves. If we can increase the speed at which the time you get paid from the time you pay the bill, right? Making it even more simply put here. If I can increase the speed at which you get paid from the moment it lands into your checking account to the moment you pay your car off, you pay your car debt, you pay your your loans. If we can increase the speed at which money goes to those debts, then in theory, that debt would get paid off faster. Now, the key here is to calculate the expense. So we've got the terms. Velocity banking is a marketing gimmick. Paycheck parking, accelerated banking, marketing gimmicks. At core, all we're doing is replacing the checking account. The purpose of doing that is to reduce and offset your interest cost of borrowing in the first place. Finally, you're left with the calculation. If I acquire more debt, that's another interest rate I have to worry about, right? So we need to calculate what is the cost of borrowing using one of these four tools from the bank. So the way you would calculate interest on a line of credit is you take the rate, let's say you're dealing with an 8% line of credit, you take that rate divided by 365 and you have your daily periodic rate, which is 0.0021918. Now to simplify that, let's say you had a balance of $10,000 owed on the line of credit times the balance owed by the interest rate. That's $800. Now, you're not gonna get charged $800 the moment you pull the 10K out. You're gonna get charged $800 over a 365 day period. So what you would have to do is you'd have to take that number of 800, and you have to divide it by 365, and your daily periodic cost rate is 2.19 per, $2.19, or in other words, 0.0021918%. That is less than 1%. So 8% became 0.0021918% in terms of your cost. So then you now have to figure out the math between the interest rate of that car. Now it's pretty easy if the car loan rate is higher than your interest rate on the line of credit, what we would call debt consolidation. So again, at its core, all velocity banking is, is debt consolidation. And I could make the argument that this form of debt consolidation is majority of the time or 
I would say almost 100% of the time better than your traditional debt consolidation or refinance. Refinance is another term. And essentially, so if we looked at debt consolidation, typically debt consolidation has fees, origination fees, less control over how that gets paid. And typically the rate is less than what you had. So if you had a 9% car loan and you could debt consolidate it to a 6%, you would be saving money, right? Or so you think you would be saving money. But the way the debt consolidation company makes their money is A, they're charging their interest rate. So they got rid of what the other institution was getting off of your interest. This institution is willing to collect 6% off of you. And on top of that, the debt consolidation company has an initiation fee, an origination fee, call it, that helps with the terms of their debt. Plus, because you move the debt, you technically refinanced it and you reset the terms of the loan. So let's say you had a car loan for seven years was the note but you have five years left on it at 9%. If you move it to the debt consolidation at 6%, they might restart it at seven years again. So when you look at the total length of interest and costs, you actually end up paying more often when you do this than if you would have just stayed with your car at that higher rate and kept paying it down the traditional way of just making extra payments. Most of the time, people are better off not consolidating their debt because they're just thinking, how can I get a lower monthly payment? That's how most uneducated people are thinking. So these companies are making massive profit because the consumer is only thinking this, not total cost, okay? So now, if we take debt consolidation with this strategy of replacing your checking account, I make the argument that A, it's cheaper, usually with a line of credit with these tools, usually in most cases, there are no fees. So no fees, cheaper, more control. What do you mean by more control, Denzel? I can do whatever I want with this line of credit, number one. Number two, when I go to move the debt into the line and then I go to move my cash flow into the line to pay it down, that's principal dollars paying down the balance owed on the line. Let's say, and my marker's dying here, so I have to get another one. Let's say you had a credit limit of $25,000. It's a credit limit and you owe 10,000 because you just moved your car debt over into the line. So now you owe 10 and you have a cash flow of a thousand moving forward, plus whatever the payment was. When you make that thousand dollar payment to the 10, right? Obviously brings it down to nine. Okay, cool. But let's say an emergency popped up and you needed that thousand. Well, you can immediately reaccess that thousand, take it back out, now owe 10,000 and handle your emergency. Versus if you would have made that thousand toward the car loan, let's say, or a thousand dollar extra payment towards a debt consolidation company, you lose control of the thousand dollars. So you have more control, no fees, and it's cheaper, even though the rate might be higher. Because again, the rate is 8%, but the daily periodic rate is way less than nine, then six over here. So now you have to say, okay, well, how many days am I paying $2.19? So then you have to work your math by figuring out the days you get paid and the days you have bills, right? So where this gets really interesting now in terms of how you can speed up your velocity of money and essentially reduce your daily periodic rate, if done properly, you can take 8% and pay less than say 2%, less than 3% over the span of one year, let's say over 12 months or over six months or three months or even one month, like looking just month to month, what I actually paid in interest versus what I would have paid if I would have just made extra payments. And in some cases, doing this strategy might yield the same or similar results if you would have just made the extra payment. So not every time is this strategy going to work in your favor. Not every time are the results going to be drastically different. They might be similar to if you would have just made extra payments. Now, if you value control of liquidity, and let's say you had to choose between making extra payments towards that car of a thousand bucks or moving the car loan into a line of credit 
and then sending your thousand dollar payment plus all your income into the line, you might value the control of liquidity in case something happens. You're able to handle an additional unexpected expense that you weren't necessarily accounting for. Versus before, if you allocate 100% of your cash flow to that debt and then an emergency pops up, guess what typically happens? Now you have to go use a credit card to handle that expense at 29%. Or you have to go to Amscot, or you have to go to payday loan, or you have to, you know, take out another loan or something. And so oftentimes we don't think about what can happen in your process of paying off debt in terms of unexpected expenses. And nobody really talks about how to deal with that, right? Other than have an emergency fund. But what if your emergency fund still doesn't cover the unexpected expense? What are you left with? Ask for money or go borrow, right? Most people don't know how to ask for help. And when they do, they'll maybe not get enough, okay? Or maybe not in time. When you borrow, it's more readily available and accessible. Now it's just a matter of how can I effectively and efficiently borrow this money and pay the least amount of costs. And I would argue that with a line of credit, credit card, HELOC, PLOC, those types of tools, you can control and reduce the interest faster and more efficiently. Hope this was very valuable to you for those that try to explain this to your family members. Those of you that get in, say, arguments in the comment sections with, with others that may disagree. And this is me just saying, like, I actually agree with many of the naysayers of this particular concept because there's, there's it's, it's like an illusion, right? It's like this magical thing, this velocity banking thing. Like, th it, it, there's nothing additional going on here you're just simply replacing the function of your checking account using one of four products credit card heloc pluck bluck or all of them in your personal finances and you're speeding up the rate at which money moves and you're reducing the interest cost faster because of when a payment gets made so oftentimes what will happen when we try to run comparisons, right? So I'm gonna race this and show what, what a lot of people do to really discredit, you know, the strategy, lossy banking, is what they'll do in their Excel calculator or whatever, is they show the, let's say we're dealing with extra payments of $1,000 and we're gonna try and pay off a car, right? We got a car loan and the car loan is 400 bucks a month is the monthly payment at a 7% interest rate. And we're going to make extra payments of a thousand bucks. When you run it through a, a scenario of a, of a calculator, the problem that you'll have out the gate is it's not going to be accurate unless you get one of those calculators that show the exact day that the money is being applied to the car loan. So let's just say the car loan due date is the first of the month. <clears throat> say it's the first of the month when it's due. And the the statement balance would recalculate the loan for the next month. Let's say that statement balance comes out, say after the fifth, right? So due dates on the first and by the fifth, you know what your payment's going to look like the next month. Depending on when you apply this thousand will affect how that thousand gets applied. A lot of people don't know this. So when you make, let's just say we're in, I'm in January of recording this video, 2024, when I'm recording this video. And let's say February is my due date for the car. And, and I have all my bills and expenses. And by January 31st is when I will see this thousand dollars. That thousand dollars will get, say, applied to the due date plus the 400. Well, obviously the, the first 400 gets satisfied. Interest gets charged off of how that payment is set up on the amortization schedule. Regardless of this thousand dollars, not gonna change that $400 payment and the interest cost. It's already been set because the month prior, after the fifth, they already tell you what the payment's gonna be on your amortized loan. So it's a fixed payment, of course, but the interest has is already going to be applied unless this thousand dollar payment is made before the next cycle occurs. That's how you can manipulate and change what that net interest will be. So for whatever month that you're in, it's not going to change how much interest comes out of that $400. But the next payment, it will. It'll have an influence on the next payment being March. This creates somewhat of a difference in, in how we pay interest. And then it also, again, typically people will have this extra cash flow way after they've already made the payment to, to the loan, which is typically the end of the month. And by then, 
they already have the next payment coming up. So on that day, people are, you know, making a payment and then they make an extra payment. Now, the other thing we have to realize is sometimes that extra payment doesn't get applied till a couple days later. Again, it's going to take time to readjust for the following payment. It, it's kind of weird, but that's a slower way of paying the debt down because of how it gets applied and when and how it gets processed. But with a line of credit, it is instant. So in a line of credit, right, let's say we moved the car loan <clears throat> into the line. When I make that thousand dollar payment, it instantly shows up. Right? So if we owed 10,000, the minute I transfer a thousand, it immediately registers, especially if you're banking at the same bank that your line of credit's at. So if your checking account is at the same bank as your line of credit, and that's where you send all your income to, you can get this instant change and that'll instantly readjust your daily periodic cost. So instead of paying interest on 10,000, now you're only paying interest on nine. And because you're no longer paying that $400 payment, now you're at 80 $600 where now you made the payment 100% principal as opposed to interest. Then what happens is only on the due date of the line, only on the due date of the line, interest gets charged and interest can come out of the line of credit itself. It does. I don't have to make an additional payment to the line. The interest can come out, out of the available credit, which would just increase the balance. But by then, I'm already sending my next paycheck. So all we're doing is increasing the speed at which money moves, replacing the function of the checking account, and doing our very best to reduce and offset the interest costs. Again, does this work 100% of the time? Absolutely not. It's simply a math equation. All you have to do is find out the daily periodic rate, and then you would basically be calculating the cost of interest every single day in a month, and that'll give you the adjusted total interest cost. Then we calculate, okay, how long does it take me to pay off this lump sum or chunk payment I just made toward that debt? If I pay off the debt, right, then I removed all the interest that was left on that loan. Now what's key is to make sure that you don't pay the same amount of interest over here in the line, if not more. Then that means that that didn't work. You didn't do anything different. You didn't, you didn't increase the velocity of money there. You, you didn't do anything. But if you move debt from there to here, and now you're at a lower interest rate environment, which means lower cost, and you paid it off sooner, then you, you save a massive amount of interest. Now what helps is running a scenario of making these extra payments, but also recognizing when that extra payment is being made. Is it being made at the end of a month going into the new month? Is it being split into three payments? Maybe you get three checks in a month or two checks in a month and every check you're just making an extra payment, right? You could even make the argument that the person that makes an extra payment of $500 sooner than the person that makes a thousand dollar payment. Like if we broke up the thousand into two $500 payments and those $500 payments went out the moment the person had got their paycheck, they would pay their car off sooner than the person that waits till the end of the month until they know how much money's left over, right? and then makes the $1,000 payment. That $1,000 is not gonna be as efficient as the two $500 payments. It's all about speed. The faster you make those extra payments or the faster we make these chunks, the faster you're gonna get out of debt, right? And then obviously, if the rate on the line of credit is lower than what you were at before, that's an obvious win. Sometimes what can be confusing is, okay, does it make sense to move a 1% car loan to a 9% debt? Off face surface value there, I'm gonna say no. But if it was a 8% line of credit and I had a 7% car loan and I'm at the very beginning of that car loan, I could make a very good argument, depending on the numbers of the individual in the capsule and what we would gain, we can make a very good argument that no, actually my 8% is going to be less than on a daily periodic rate, less than the 7% making extra payments. Because understand extra payments does bring down the 7% cost. Maybe it brings it down to six, five and a half. Whereas my 8% line might bring my actual net cost down to two or three. So then you make that comparison, then it creates a couple months of a gap. Then the other value here is the control factor. Every thousand I make towards that car, I no longer have access to it. Every thousand 
that I have in cash flow that goes into the line of credit, I can reaccess those funds again. So my name is Denzel Rodriguez, your personal finance geek of the 21st century. I do a lot of case studies, looking at velocity banking, showing when it makes sense, when it doesn't. I'm even someone that recognizes that, wait a minute, we can combine velocity banking and debt snowball together. We can get the best of both worlds and say, we could maybe start out with debt snowball, making extra payments towards your debt, then strategically acquiring a line of credit to speed things up. And then maybe by the time we get to the mortgage, maybe we don't do it. Or maybe we don't pay off that 1% car loan with this 9% line of credit. And we just go back to extra payments. So when you map out the person that's incorporating both compared to the person that's just doing one, you could absolutely make an argument. This person's going to be out of debt faster in you know record time. And also they have more liquidity, more capital to work with. They can take that same mindset of accelerating debt using a, a line of credit, these different tools, take that same mindset and apply it towards investing and making money. What if, what if instead of just paying off debt, what if we use the line of credit to invest, right? At say a 8% line to double your money. You put $50,000 into a project, into a business, and it creates another $50,000 and it costs you 8% to do it. And then if you incorporate a velocity, you bring that 8% down to four. So you borrowed at four to invest 50 to generate 50 more thousand, a hundred total, hundred percent return or 25% return, depending on what it is that you're doing. Maybe you acquired a business. Maybe you're building a personal brand. Maybe you start a YouTube channel. Maybe you join someone's business and that's going to increase your income and it requires capital or startup whatever it may be. Maybe you just simply invest in the market using and leveraging debt and just creating arbitrage. You're arbitraging the debt. So many possibilities here. It just gets, your, gets you to you know think, right? Think a lot differently. So again, shout out to Rich, School of Personal Finance for making the video. Thank you for what you do. You're doing great work. Uh, maybe one day, someday, we'll jump on a, on a call and record some content together and discuss different ideas and go from there. Have a wonderful day. God bless. And we'll talk to you soon.